Pastor JB, can you come on up? You know, I came and visited Texas in uh, January of 1999, and, and that's when the Lord spoke to me uh, on a Wednesday that week I was here. The Lord told me to come and visit and, and had no idea uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd be here, uh, still be here, but God. And God had a plan. And Lord, I know coming in to sit in here on a Friday meeting, I was in part of the Bible school, but they allowed guests to come in on Friday, and that's when they had special guest speakers. And on that day, there was two gentlemen, one's a pastor in Kansas named Quentin Moore, and there was another fiery pastor from North Carolina named J.B. Whitfield. And being 26 at the time, I said, I hope when I'm his age, I have that much energy. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so, you know, just his... Uh, his, his heart for God, his exuberance for life, and, and him and Pastor Susan have been pastoring the same church for uh, 42, years. 42 years, and I know Dr. Fell just was with you uh, for your 40th year anniversary, and I know you'll, you'll share some stuff uh, concerning that, but um, we thank you for being here, and Dr. Fell asked you to come minister, and you, he FaceTimed me and said, hey, can, can I have a conversation with you? I was like, sure. He goes, well, you didn't ask me to come speak. Dr. Savell did. And I was like, do you, do you still want me to come? I said, well, Dr. Savell is a man that can hear from God. <laughs> so, so I believe there was something on the inside of him that our church needed. So we declare uh, over you that you have freedom to deposit what's in you into us. Because for us, this is a year of progressing, advancing, experiencing promotion and seeing our high expectations fulfilled. That's our prophetic word. So whatever you're depositing in us today is going to bring that to pass in us. Amen. 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 So welcome Hallelujah. Pastor J.B. Whitfield. Glory. Yeah. Woo. Hallelujah. Come on. I can't hear you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I'm, I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. What an honor it is to be standing in this pulpit that Dr. Savelle has ministered in, that Carolyn has ministered in, Pastor Carla, Pastor Justin, Pastor Annette, Joe, and all others that have ministered in this pulpit. I'm honored to be here today. And uh, 1984, my wife and I were laying out in the sun. I think laying out in the sun is scriptural. Because Peter went to Simon the Tanner's house. Come on. And the Bible says he went up on the roof. And you don't go up on the roof at Simon the Tanner's house unless you're going to lay out in the sun. And he had a vision. So every time I lay out in the sun, I'm expecting a vision, praise God. Well, 1984, my wife, by the way, this is my beautiful wife, Susan, would you stand? Stand up, let everybody see you. Praise God. Hallelujah. We've been together 48 years, married 46. Glory to God. And uh, she hadn't changed one bit. Her hair color has been the same all these years. I don't know why, but mine changed different colors. But, uh, but where was I? We were laying out in the sun, and I was expecting to have a vision, but we were listening to a tape by... Carla Porter on tithing. I don't know if y'all remember that uh, message that she taught back in the 80s, Tithe the Tithe. Well, we were laying out in the sun listening to that tape, and, and I sat straight up on, in my chair, and I said, I have never heard tithing taught like this. She's got to come to our church and teach it. So I called uh, Jezebel Ministries and asked to speak to Carla. Well, they sent me to Wade <laughs> rather than Carla. And so I sat and talked to Wade, and I told him what I just shared with you, and we set it up for them to come to Clemens, North Carolina. And they came. They spent 10 days with us, and, uh, and at that time, we had a, a place in Clemens, and it, it was uh, R.J. Reynolds. And if you ever heard of Reynolds Tobacco, you know, R.J. Reynolds, they had their summer home out in Clemens from Winston-Salem, not but seven miles apart. But back then, it took a while to get there. And uh, they built a beautiful home there, and they turned it into a uh, hotel. And uh, so we put Wade and Carl out there, uh, and they were there for 10 days. And we would get with them 
During the week, I mean, they, they taught at our church all week long. Actually, they taught for 10, 10 nights. But we would sit with them after service at night in the car, and, uh, and we'd talk to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And, and close the next morning, I had to get up and go to the church, okay? And I said, I am not sitting up till 3 o'clock in the morning, and we'd do it again. And I felt like I was in Bible school listening to uh, Wade and Carl. And we just connected at that moment. Well, then, in um, uh, a few weeks later, Wade calls me. He said, meet me in Christiansburg, Virginia. I said, okay. <laughs> and so we go to Rob and Trish Sowell's church in Christiansburg, Virginia. And he said, Jerry is going to be there. And I want you to meet him. I said, well, I do too. <laughs> and, I mean, 1980, my wife and I, We'd found out about the word of fire. I was a Methodist minister, by the way. I wasn't saved. <laughs> I'm serious. I served two Methodist churches, went through school, got a degree, got my degree. You know, that and the, I used to say that and a dollar and a half to get you a cup of coffee, and that's five bucks. But anyway, but, but I was a Methodist minister. I served two Methodist churches. Wasn't even saved. It's good to have your pastor saved. Can you say Amen. Hallelujah. So, so we, we ended up uh, going through a lot of stuff. I owned my own business, going through a lot of stuff. And got involved in drugs and alcohol and all that. And in the midst of that, we got saved. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, how, how did I get into that story? I'm telling one story, and I done started telling two or three more stories. But anyway, so anyway, we go, I go to Christiansburg, Virginia, and we're there that night. It's a tent meeting. And after the meeting, Wade comes over to me and said, see that car over there? I said, yeah. He said, go get in the back seat. I don't know whose car it is. I don't know who I'm in. And I got in the back seat. Well, when I got in the back seat, I sat down, and uh, the door opened, and Dr. Savelle sat down beside me. I said, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> I said, oh, God, oh, God, if you show him anything, let, Lord, I repent now. I don't, know what I, I don't know what I've done, but I repent. I just, Lord, anything, clean it out now. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, because in 1980, uh, we'd heard about the word of faith, but we made the decision that the word of faith didn't work. It, wasn't, it didn't work for us. It might have worked for everybody else, but it didn't work for us. And so a friend of ours made us go to Charlotte to the Civic Center where y'all were ministering down there. You remember that back in the 80s. And uh, she made us go. And she said, now, Pastor, when you tell this story, tell the whole story. I said, what do you mean? She said, we were late getting to the meeting. Now, you tell them why we were late. And she said, we were late because you wanted to stop at Snook's Barbecue and get a barbecue sandwich. I was hungry, okay? So I didn't really want to go to the meeting anyway because I was fed up with the word of faith. And we get to that meeting that night. We got there late. We walk in. We sit down. And, uh, and Dr. Savelle said, the Lord told me, that many of you here tonight, that you're, you are shipwrecked. Boy, he was right on right there. I mean, my ship has taken on water, and, and uh, he said, tonight God is going to turn your ship afloat. Glory to God. I have no idea what he preached because I started crying, and I cried the whole night. I don't even know what he preached, but all I know is our ship turned back up afloat. Glory. Now, we've taken a couple of torpedo hits since then, but it ain't been sunk, glory to God. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Can, can I tell you one more story? Uh, 1981, uh, I think it was 81, uh, y'all with Brother Copeland at the Civic, I mean at the Coliseum in Charlotte. That's when Brother Jerry had the revelation that Jesus, I mean, Jesus visited him in his room that day. And uh, he comes out, and Brother Copeland puts his Bible down on the podium that night and, and uh, read his scripture and tried to do it again. And, play, and he kept looking over at Brother Jerry and then put his, and then finally he turned to Jerry and said, he said, Jerry, Jesus visited you this afternoon in your hotel room. Come tell us what he said. Well, Jerry came up, and that's the night that he preached on sowing in famine. And can I share something with you? We was in famine. I mean, we was below famine. 
if, if somebody asked me how you doing and I could have said broke, I'd have been happy because I was so far below broke. Are y'all with me? And, and we didn't have any money. When I say any money, I mean no money. I don't mean we didn't have any money on us. We didn't have any money, period. I couldn't write a check because he could have dribbled it all the way back to Fort Worth. We didn't have any money. I mean, we had no cash. We had no money in the bank. We did have, my wife reminded me, we did have beanie weenies in the cabinet at home so the kids could eat. Hallelujah. But we had nothing. We lost our house, lost a car. We lost everything. And he said, so in famine. So I, I, back then I had $100 faith. I wish I was there now. I'd have, I'd have $10,000 faith today. But that, that I had, so I wrote an IOU for a hundred dollars, and I folded up. And the and the guy sitting beside me, he said, "You go." And Jerry said, "Bring all your checks, all your money, everything, and throw it on the platform." He said, "You gonna throw that IOU on the platform?" I said, "I sure am." <laughs> he said, "He looked at me like you lost your mind." I folded that IOU up, put my name and address, everything. I went up there and threw that thing on the platform. And I said, God, the first $100 I get is going to Kenneth Copeland Ministries to pay that IOU. We went to church on Sunday morning. We're leaving church, and, and I wasn't passing then. We're leaving church, and this guy runs up to me, JB, 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 and he stuck something in my pocket. I couldn't hardly wait to get in my car to look at it. And when I opened it up, it was a check for $100. <laughs> Woo! Honey, I, listen, don't eat your seed. Do not eat your seed. I mean, I could have used that hundred dollars in a lot of places. Yes, uh, I could have used it, but, but I made a decision. No, that hundred dollars is going to Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Yes. Well, Doctor Savell said you will make you will get a hundredfold return in this year. That was October. At that time, I was traveling with CBS. My territory was North Carolina to Maine. And in December of that year, that was October, I sold $100, hundredfold return. In December, I made $11,000. Come on now. Come on now. I said I made $11,000. Why? Off of sowing an IOU. But it wasn't my IOU that earned the earned the, the hundredfold return. It was obedience of Dr. Savell to share the word and then just to sow it when he said sow it. Can you say amen? Can, do you know you can't outgive God? I mean, I know this place knows this, but you can't outgive God. You ought to try it sometime. You ought to just try to outgive him and watch what he does. Glory. I'm about to get excited this morning. Glory to God. Are y'all with me today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so we're sitting in the back of that car, and, and Brother Jerry reaches over and grabs me by the knee. And he says, uh, I'm supposed to I believe I'm supposed to come to your church. I said, Yes, you are, praise God. And he came that year, and he came almost every year since then. And in, in our 40th uh, anniversary, he and Carolyn both came, and Pastor Carla came. And what an honor it was for you to be there, Carolyn. And I want to thank you for all these years of relationship. We've been a partner with Savelle Ministries since 1984. And so thank you for all you are doing and all you're continuing to do, and we love you very much. And your family. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. 2024, we know what Dr. Savell said. He said, we got to stay in faith. Yes. Look at somebody say, you got to stay in faith. Yes. Then he said, we got to remain focused on the promises of God. Yes. How many of you know we got promises? Yes. Say, we got to remain focused yes. on the promises of God. Yes. Boy, y'all didn't get real loud on that one, but okay. <laughs> but then, then he also said, don't allow anything in the world to distract you from those promises. How many of you know the world will do everything it can to distract us? The world will do everything it can to pull us away from following the promises of God and doing what God's called us to do. 
the Lord spoke to me about 2024, and uh, I've shared this with our congregation, but he said 2024 will be an epic year, an epic year. Epic mean great. Epic mean, mean, mean adventurous. And in that, he said that the year will be a year of, of new achievements. I believe many folk here today are going to, if you haven't stepped into it yet, you're going to step into some new achievements this year. You're going to achieve some things that you never thought were possible. You're going to achieve some things that you know God spoke to you years ago that now you're going to step on out right into the midst of them and watch what God does. And then he said, it's not only the year of new achievements, but the year of new opportunities. How many of you know this is the year of new opportunities? Glory to God. And he's got an opportunity just waiting for each one of us if we'll step out and take hold of it in Jesus' name. And, and then it said, it's going to be, of course, you know uh, what uh, Brother Copeland said, and that is going to be the year of the, uh, of the open door and uh, uh, new open doors. Somebody say new open doors. New open doors. And how many of you know if we're going to receive this, how many of you know we've got to walk by faith? Yeah. Everybody say faith. Faith. Say faith. faith. How many of you know you can't even please God without faith? Glory to God. I mean, I, I mean, the Bible, 39 times, listen, 39 times the Bible says that we, uh, that we, the righteous or the just, must live or walk by faith. I, I think if the Holy Ghost says it once, I think 39 times puts a little importance on it. Can you say amen? amen. And, uh, and, and so, but you know what? The, the Lord just dropped this down in my heart. Uh, several months ago, and that is there are a lot of people today that are so disappointed because they've not seen their, the results of their faith. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, and what the Lord ministered to my heart about that was that many people confuse two words. They confuse expect, expectant and expectancy. They confuse expecting, rather, and expectancy. There's a difference. See, we can live expecting something. Expecting something, listen, expectation is the state or act of waiting on an event to happen. In other words, it's got a time frame. It's going to happen at a certain time. And how many of us have put time frames on God? Am I the only one here this morning? We, we get a word from God and we put the time frame on it, not God. And we put the, 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 the parameters on it, not God. And so what happens is because it doesn't happen in the time frame when we think it's going to happen, it doesn't happen with the, the, in, the, in the parameters of what we thought was going to happen, how we thought it was going to happen, when we thought it was going to happen, then we lose our expectancy. We lose our hope. But how do you know we need to live every day in expectancy? The word expectancy is an open-ended anticipation. Everybody say an open-ended anticipation. I mean, expecting the tikva, the Hebrew word tikva means to look for with outstretched neck. I can't get mine any further. But you're looking around the corner with an outstretched neck because you know it's about to happen. You might not know when it's going to happen. You might not know what day it's going to happen. But I know this. I'm getting up in the morning, glory to God. I'm getting up expecting it to happen. Hallelujah. I'm like oh, Robert. Something good is about to happen to me. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. I believe something good about to happen to you. I believe something great's about to take place. Can you say amen? amen. I mean, you got to think about it. Abraham had a spirit of expectancy. He just wasn't expecting yet a spirit of expectancy. He and, he and Isaac are going up on the mountain. Y'all know the story. He and Isaac are going up on the mountain. And uh, what does Isaac do? Dad, we got the wood. Y'all know this. Dad, we got the fire. Dad, we got the knife. But where be the sacrifice? Where, 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 where be the sacrifice, Dad? And Abraham, you know, Abraham could have fallen down on his knees. And he could have said, oh, son, I am so sorry. 
but you be the sacrifice. I'm so sorry. No, he didn't. What did he say? God will provide. When he released those words out of his mouth, that, that ram started up the side of that mountain. Abraham, Abraham and Isaac are going up this side of the mountain, and he's looking at Isaac, and he's saying, God will provide. He takes another step. That ram started over there. He took a step. But if Abraham had a step back and said, oh, son, I don't know, that ram would have started back down. See, what, you know how many times we start up with our mouth? We, we move our ram back down. God's bringing our ram up. He's bringing our need into a, our Moed moment. He's bringing the manifestation of what we have been believing him for. And then we open our mouth with the wrong words and it stops it. This is good preaching. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. But what I want to talk to you about for the next, uh, Pastor Justin said we had till two o'clock. And he said he's going to provide lunch for all of us. Okay. <laughs> they all got excited about that, Pastor Justin. Hallelujah. No, no. But what I want to talk to you about over these next few moments is something that the Lord spoke to my heart. And I was hesitant even to say it, but, but what the Lord spoke to my heart, and he says, what to do when things go from bad to worse? What to do when things go from bad to worse. And, uh, you know, the word bad means not good in any manner or degree. The word bad means inadequate or below standard. And, uh, and, and the word worse means just inadequate and below standard at a higher degree, at a higher level. And, uh, uh, and the one thing that we must understand in everything that we do in our life everywhere we go in our life, that our standard is the Word of God. Yes, it is. You know, no matter what we're discussing, no matter what we're talking about, that, that, you know, if it's a moral issue or whatever the issue may be, we've got to go back to say, what do the Bible say? What does the Bible say? That's where I place my standard. My standard is on the Bible, on the Word of God. And anything going on in our lives that's below the standard of the Word. It doesn't line up with the Bible. It doesn't line up with what the Bible says. It doesn't line up with the promises of God for us. Then that means it is below standard. And we have a right to change that. Can you say amen? We have a right to do something about that. And so I want to teach you this morning on how to do that. You probably already know it, so listen, this is a faith church. This is a word church. Okay, so you're not going to hear anything this morning out of me that's new revelation. Because you've been here long enough that, you know, if somebody comes in and says, I got a new revelation, you better be careful. <laughs> Amen? Because how many of you know the Bible is still our standard that we must live by and our standard that we must walk by? Can you say Amen. And so open your Bibles, if you will, please, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And, uh, and I want to talk to you about, seriously, what to do when things go from bad to worse. What to do when things aren't working out the way we thought they were going to work out. What to do when it doesn't seem like there's coming a change that, that we've been believing for, that we've been declaring about, and that we've been talking about. But what to do when that happens. And so... Um, um, Mark chapter 5, and let's begin reading in verse 21. And it says, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, everybody say behold. behold. And behold, everybody say behold. behold. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, um, uh, came and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. So sometimes we miss some very important things in the Word because we, we're just so familiar with it. But whenever you see the word behold, or whenever you see the word verily, verily, truly, truly, uh, surely, surely, you know, whenever you see those words, the Holy Spirit is wanting to emphasize something yeah and bring it out a little bit out of that passage of Scripture, he's wanting to emphasize it 
for us to take hold of something in the Word. And he says, behold. Well, behold there, the word behold in the Hebrew means to see or to gaze at with wide open eyes as seeing something remarkable. So in other words, you've got to picture this now. I, I want you to get a picture of this. Here's Jesus, and he's walking along. He's the new rabbi in town. He's a new rabbi. And here's Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. This is Capernaum. He's the ruler of the synagogue. Now, the ruler of the synagogue was the CEO, if you will, of the synagogue. Now, what the CEO of the synagogue would do is that he would make sure he was over the staff. He was over all the staff of the synagogue. Uh, he also made sure that the um, proper Torah scriptures were read properly each day that they were supposed to read. He also scheduled the rabbis that would be reading them and teaching. So here's the, the head dude in the, in the largest synagogue in that area all of a sudden coming to this new rabbi that all the other rabbis don't like. Matter of fact, this new rabbi called them whitewashed tombs, snakes and vipers. I mean, I, I believe a, if I called a church member that, they probably wouldn't come back. Hello? But Jesus called them that. But here's this ruler of the synagogue, very, everybody say, influence. He was a very influential man in that city. But what did Jairus do? He said, said he came to Jesus. Do you know what the word came means? It means to come. To. <laughs> I'm going to lighten up in a minute. I know that's heavy, but it means to come to. But when you break that down, see, our English, does not, our English doesn't say what Hebrew phrases say. See, one Hebrew word can say a, mean a whole lot more than what our one English word means. And the Hebrew, faith, the Hebrew phrase here actually says, and actually means, listen to this now, to leave one place of influence. To leave, leave one place of influence and go to another place of influence. Now here's the CEO of the synagogue he, he is the head of the synagogue. He's being influenced by all these rabbis. He's been influenced by, to, by the Torah. He's being influenced by all the scriptures that have been read. He's been influenced by all of them, but he's facing a tough situation in his life. And, and the tough situation that he's facing in his life, he recognized where he was receiving his influence, they couldn't help him. You better, you better know who you're receiving from. Let me, can I share something with you? And I don't know if I need to say this or not, but don't you go anywhere. You're in the right place of influence this morning. I, and, and where's the camera? Right there in the middle. And those of you that aren't here this morning, that you've been thinking about going somewhere else, you better get yourself back over here. I command you to get back over here in the name of Jesus. Why? Because God sent you here. And this is your place of influence. See, that's what happens in churches all over the world. We make the decision that we're going to, the pastor didn't speak to me Sunday morning. And they, they talk about money a lot. Come to our church. But anyway, move right along. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't like the songs they sing. I love them, by the way. But if people leave churches... And they think they're just leaving a church. No, they're not just leaving a church. They're leaving their God-ordained place of influence. And the word influence means the ability to affect a person, a thing, or outcome of an event. Hallelujah. The ability to affect the outcome, results, uh, 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 a person, event, or the, wait a minute, I'm going to get it in a minute. 
What did I say the definition was? No, the ability to affect a person, a thing, or the outcome of events. That's why people leave churches and their lives fall apart. Because God set them there. And then, I know in our, in our area, this hadn't happened in years, but in our area, every time a new church would spring up, folk would, folk would go. They think the grass is always greener. And then it wouldn't be long, and they're slipping in the back. (laughs) Hello? So if if the enemy's trying to tell you you need to find another place of influence, you rebuke him in the name of Jesus. You rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he had to find a new place of influence. So what does he do? He goes to Jesus. And, and the Bible says, um, what does the Bible say? And he fell down in front of, I, can I just preach? Y'all know the Bible, right? You know the Bible. I'm sure Pastor Justin's preached this scripture more than once. But all of a sudden, here comes the CEO. Uh, you know what? We're going to act this out. Y'all with me? Pastor Michael, come here. You're Jay Iris. This is Pastor Michael Watson. He's our student ministries pastor at our church. This is his beautiful wife, Pastor Belinda. She's our children's pastor. Hallelujah. And this is Mark and Donna Bennett. They're, they're our armor bearers from Clemens. But she does, everywhere my wife goes, she goes because she does her hair. <laughs> and you guys, can I share something with you? Our schedule operates around two things. Nails and hair. I can't schedule anything for the two of us until I check. You got a nail appointment? Have you got a hair appointment? And that's the right thing to do. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So I want you to picture this. I want you to get a picture of this now. Here's Jesus walking through Capernaum. And here comes Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. I said, here comes J.I. He's going to run because it says he ran. No, no, I don't think he ran. But anyway, he came. And he fell down at his feet and began to worship him. I ain't hearing nothing. Worship him. <laughs> can, I get a, can I get another J.I. up here? Okay. And he began to. Jesus, he, I worship you. I praise you. <laughs> That's amazing. Then, no. And then. And then Jairus does this. He said, will you come and lay? My daughter is at home sick. Jairus said that. My daughter's at home sick. Will you You come come and lay your hands hands on her and and she she will be made well. She will be made well. What a powerful statement. Here's this religious man. Here's this man who'd been the CEO of the synagogue all these years. And now all of a sudden, he's not counting on religion. He's not counting on what the rabbis in that synagogue had to say. No, he came to Jesus, he fell down, and he began to worship him. you got to get a picture of this. He's probably the richest man in Capernaum, the most influential man in Capernaum, but he don't care what anybody else thinks. He don't care what the world thinks. He don't care what the religious folk think. Why? He's got a situation that's bad. His daughter is lying at the point of death, and they couldn't help him. You better know where your help comes from. You better know who's going to pray for you. You better know who's going to stay up at night and pray with you. You better know who's going to minister to you. You better know who's going to lay their life on the line for you. Not every pastor will do it, but you got real pastors right here. I said, you got real pastors right here. And I'll tell you right now, they love you, they pray for you, they stand in the gap on your behalf. Are they perfect? No. And if anybody thinks you're perfect, come on and finish this sermon. Because none of us are. But you have to recognize the fact that if this is your place of influence, and you have been influenced through the teaching of Dr. Savelle, 
You've been influenced through the teaching of Carolyn and Carla. You've been influenced through the teaching of Pastor Justin and Pastor Ned. You've been influenced through the teaching of Joe and all the others that are here teaching. You've been influenced through their ministry, influenced through their teaching. Well, you don't leave because somebody new comes to town. Now, I don't know if that's happening or not, but in Clemens, North Carolina, we got those, we got to follow the new thing, people. Now, that had happened a while, but it used to. Are y'all with me? And so he came, and he said to Jesus, come here, Jay Iris. And he said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, will you come and lay your hands on my daughter, and she shall be made whole. This is a faith statement from the CEO of the synagogue. He's heard something. I mean, religion didn't teach him that. He heard something that caused him to not care about what anybody in town thought, to not care about where he was, to not care. He, caught, he went and he bowed down in front of the new rabbi that all the other rabbis were against. See, you can't worry about what folk think. You call yourself healed when you ain't healed. Don't worry about what it is. You of that name and claimant group. You're that blab it and grab it. Yes, I am. Glory to God. I've been, I'm still, I know y'all know this saying. I learned this from Brother Savelle years ago. I'm still dancing with the one that brung me. Why? Because faith brung me out of a quarter of a million dollars in debt, out of drugs and alcohol and turn my family around. Now, all of our oldest daughter's in heaven. She went to heaven in, in February of 2019. And, uh, but all of her, her, both her children and all of our children, rest of our children, all of our nine grandchildren, and, uh, well, I started to say all of our nine great-grandchildren are all saved, but one of them just six months old. He's saved, though. I call him saved. Amen. So all our family is saved. Hallelujah. Why? Why is all of our family saved? It wasn't all like that. Our son was in prison. Boy, it got quiet in here then. Man. I mean, I didn't, I didn't put him there. I would have if I could have. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I would have. I mean, what did he do? He, he, he got involved in drugs, but he took it to the extreme. And he, he spent four years in federal prison. But while he was there, on the bus, on, oh, I don't know why I'm telling you all this, but on the bus from, from where he was sentenced to the federal prison, on the bus the Lord said, I'm going to break you this time. And the Lord broke him. Now he's on staff at our church. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Speaking in tongues. Loving. Going to Bible school. He's going to Bible school. Woo. Don't tell me. There ain't nothing too hard for God. All things are possible with our God. Hey. Everything is. Our God is a good God. Hallelujah. Pastor Justin, if you can't preach in this church, your wood is wet. I'm telling you, it's an easy place to preach. Hallelujah. So Jairus comes to Jesus, and he said, Jesus, my daughter is lying at the point of death. Will you come and lay your hands on her, and she shall be made whole? Jesus said, yeah, I'll go. So here they go. Can you see them? I don't know if they were holding hands or not, but... So here they go. Here goes Jesus and Jairus walking along. And all of a sudden, a certain woman comes up behind and grabs hold of the hem of Jesus' garment. Got to grab him to stop him. She stopped him. She got healed already. No. It's my sermon. You don't get healed before I tell you you're healed. Y'all still love me? 
We didn't practice this, by the way. So we're walking, they're walking along, and all of a sudden, the woman grabs hold of Jesus' hem of his garment. I didn't mean rip it, just hold on to it. And he stops, and he makes a statement. He said, who touched me? I want you to hear this now, church. Please hear this. Because he said, who touched me? And his disciples said, what do you mean, who touched you? What did he say? The multitudes are thronging you. See, that's the problem. Too many people come to church thronging rather than touching. Come on, church. See, the word touch there means, well, let me tell you what the word throng means first. The word thronging means to uh, bump up against by mistake. In other words, you know, you're walking along, and all of a sudden, oh, excuse me. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to hit you or not. <laughs> and you bump, up, you, you bump up against them by mistake. And what do you say? When you, you ever walked in a mall or gone through a door and somebody's coming out of that door, and all of a sudden you hit them by mistake, you say, excuse me. Why? You did not mean to hit them. But here's the multitude. They didn't mean to touch Jesus. That's why they didn't get anything. Do you know how many people come to church on Sunday morning? They really don't mean to touch the anointing. They really don't mean to reach out and take hold of the Word. They're just going through their obligation to be in church on Sunday morning. Listen, church, you got you to gotta come to church on Sunday morning ready to take hold of the anointing, take hold of the Word of God. Hallelujah. And, 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 and the word touch there means... To stick to like glue. It means, it means suction. You, you know why a suction cup, you know, stick on a window and you can hang something on it? Because there's more pressure on the inside than there is on the outside. And so what happens is when Jesus said, who touched me, he knew somebody done touched him on the inside and drawn it to the outside and change their life. Are y'all with me? And so the Bible says that he and Jairus are walking and all of a sudden Jesus stops. He says, who touched me? And he turns around and he sees this woman and she then tells him everything that she'd been through. And she told him, you know, the Bible says, that she's had a blood, flow of blood for 12 years. And the Bible says she spent everything that she had but got no better, but rather grew, rather grew worse. She had a bad situation to begin with because she uh, had a bloody flow and they couldn't heal her. Now she's gone to worse. Now she broke. She's broken and, 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 and sick. Well, I said she spent all that she had and, and didn't get any better, but rather grew worse. And I, I was reading that one day, and it just hit me, and all of a sudden I thought, yes, yeah, it's a good thing she ran out of money. Because if she hadn't ran out of money, we might not be reading about her. Why? She had her faith in the doctors. Now, I love doctors. Thank God for doctors. We got several doctors in our church. I'm glad they're there. Don't you, aren't you glad doctors are there? Yeah. I'm glad for doctors. Yes, sir. But I can tell you what happened was she had her faith in the wrong place. Yeah. And so now she, the Bible, y'all know the story. Pastor Justin's been preaching this. Y'all know, what did she do? She heard about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when she heard about Jesus, she said, this is a classic faith sermon. Yeah. You know, you can preach it. I know he's preached it. She heard, she said, she did. That's how you get it, church. You hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Okay? So she heard. And then she said, how many you know? You know, you're going you're gonna to get what you say. You are. I don't care what you say. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. 
Hallelujah. Do you know the word power while I'm on the subject? Do you know the word power there in that scripture, life and death in the power of the tongue? That word, you look it up. That word power is the Hebrew word yad, Y-A-D. It means hand. Do you know you got a hand in your mouth? Everybody, everybody put your hand up like this. And whatever you say, your hand is going to go out and take hold of it and bring it back to you. My wife and I started something, and, uh, and I'd say something, and then, or she'd say something, and we'd look at each other and say, you want me to agree with that? No. But I want you to picture this now. You got a hand in your mouth. And whatever you are saying, negative, whatever you're saying gossip-wise, whatever you're saying in an in a, a unbiblical way, your hand is going out. And it's going to take hold of it. And it's going to bring it back to you. So every time you get ready to say something, don't you picture yourself like this. Picture that hand there going out and taking hold of it. See, Jesus said, whatever we say, when we, whatever, whatever we believe, whatever, when we pray. <laughs> Help me out, Pastor. Whenever we pray and we believe, we will, see, we will receive what we say. Amen? Amen? Now, in the New Testament, there are two words for the, uh, there are two Greek words for receive. One is to have presented to. The other is to take hold of. You know, the problem in many people in the body of Christ today is they have a lot presented to them, but they don't take hold of it. Do you know how you know if you take hold of it? By what's coming out of your mouth. Do you know how you know if you've taken hold of faith? By what's coming out of your mouth. Do you know how you take, no, you're, you're, you want to be like God, call things that be not as though they were? Hallelujah. I'm calling things. I'm like, uh, hey, are y'all with me? Now, if you got a fever, your nose is running, you are coughing, and you ache all over, you do not say, I don't have a fever. I, I, my nose is not running. Just want y'all to know that. Uh, don't, uh, you know, I am not achy all over. Da, 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 da. You'd be lying if you say that. No, what you say is, yep, I might have a fever. Yep, my nose might be running. I might be achy all over. But let me tell you something. I am healed by the stripes on Jesus' back. I call myself healed. I call myself whole and well in Jesus' name. I'm calling things that be not as though they were. Hallelujah. How come I got into all that? But anyway, so the first thing you got to do is you got to find your place of influence. And if you're here this morning, you already found it. The second thing you got to do is you got to properly attach to your place of influence. Do you know how you attach to the place of influence here? Number one, by praying. Praying for your pastors. Praying for the leaders of the church. Praying for the vision. Praying for the members of the church. Praying, spending time in prayer. Yes, sir. Yes, Number two, do you know how you attach, properly attach, properly attach to this place of influence? You serve. Serving. Right. Hallelujah. That means get up off your blessed assurance and do something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every person here has a gift. That's right. And every person's gift has been sent here for a purpose, and that purpose is to serve this ministry, to serve them. Well, they don't need any help. Hey, ain't got nothing to do with what they need. What's got to do is what do you need? You need to be serving. And do you know the Bible says serving, the definition of it is worship. To serve is to worship. Are y'all with me? So you properly attach by praying, you properly attach by serving, and you properly attach by giving. If you're not a tithe and an offering giver, repent. I mean, come on. Giving. Tithing and offering giving is, is God's word. Hallelujah. And you properly attach to this place of influence by praying, by serving, by giving. Now listen to this last one. You properly attach to this place of influence by bringing. 
bringing. What does that mean? Bring people to church with you. Go out into the highways and the byways. Get them saved and bring them to church on Sunday. Bring them in. Bring them in so we ain't got room for them. Hallelujah. We all, we all can pray. We all can serve. We all can give. And we can all bring. And when you do that, you're properly attaching yourself to your place. Not their place, your place of influence. You're not doing it for Pastor Justin and, and, and Pastor Annette. You're not doing it for, uh, you know, for Carolyn. You're not doing it for Jerry Savelle Ministries. You're doing it for you and God. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says that while Jesus was talking to the woman, a messenger from Jairus' house you're healed, whole, and well. <laughs> Go thy way in peace. That's what he said. No. <laughs> but it says, while he was talking to her, a messenger from Jairus' house came and said to him, bother the master no longer. Your daughter is dead. Okay? Now, the living translation says this, and I love the living translation. Because the Living Translation says, don't bother the master any longer. It's too late. It's too late. Do you know how many times the devil will tell somebody it's too late? You're too old. You're too young. Hallelujah. I mean, uh, I mean my wife is going to turn 79 years old this week. So I'll be my, I'm almost married to an 80-year-old woman. <laughs> A beautiful woman. Hallelujah. And I married an older woman. Anyway, she'll get me when we leave, okay? But listen, listen. Says, says what was I talking about? No. I'm really, what was I talking about? It's too late. Thank you. See, I just want to make sure you're paying attention. They said, don't bother the master. It's too late. How I many you know it's never too late? Never. So the first thing you got to recognize is you got to know where your place of influence is. And it's not the new kids in town. It's not the new kid down the street. And it's not the, you know, it's not television uh, preachers, although I love them, thank God for them. But you don't stay home and watch them. You come to church. This is your place of influence. Then you properly attach to your place of influence and you properly attach to it by, your, by, by praying, serving, giving, and, and, uh, and, and bringing. Thank you. And, uh, and then the third thing is, what I want you to take hold of today is, I want you to always remember it's never too late. It's never too late. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Only believe. It's never too late. And then he goes on with Jairus, and he gets to Jairus' house. Now, what, what we need to recognize is that in those days they had professional mourners. They would pay people to mourn for them. And the more uh, influence you had, the wealthier you were, the more mourners you had. Well, well, Jairus was a very influential man in the city, so he, his house is filled with mourners. And uh, when they get there, the, the mourners, you know, I was trying to figure out who's going to be my mourning group but y'all going to be the mourners, okay? The whiners, the mourners. Now, I told you you shouldn't have sat in this section, but anyway. All right, and when Jesus gets there, they're mourning. Come on, come on. They're greedy, they're mourning. Oh, oh, oh. Y'all, y'all used to that, aren't you? Okay, no, no. They're mourning, and Jesus said, what are you mourning about? Hush, be quiet. And he put them all out. Don't y'all go. <laughs> but he put them all out. And he said, why are you mourning? She's not dead. She's sleeping. And then what did they do? They laughed at him. They laughed at him. Say Come what? on. That's, <laughs> That's what they did. They laughed at him. Hallelujah. So what did Jesus do? Jesus goes in to where the little girl is, and y'all know the story. 
he reaches down and takes her by the hand, Talit Kikumi or something like that, right? Is that pretty close, Pastor? Okay. Anyway, Talit Kikumi, right? Hey, look at there. Talit Kikumi, which is translated. Say it with me. Little girl, I say to you, arise. I say to every person here this morning that if you've got things that the enemy's telling you it's too late, you got things the enemy's laughing at you about. You got things that other people have said you'll never step in. I say to you, arise. I say, 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 arise. Come on. Come on. Somebody give him praise. Come on. Somebody arise and give him thanks. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. It's never too late. We bless you and worship you. We bless you and magnify you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for every vision that has been laid aside, that it arises this morning. I thank you, Father God, for every word that's ever been spoken to anyone that we've, we've not stood on it today. It arises today. It arises today. I thank you for it, Father. Father, I thank you that today marriages, marriages, marriages are arising to a higher level. Glory to God. Glory to God. I thank you today, Father. Oh, my. Some businesses, some businesses are going to rise to a new level. Glory to God. So, some of you have been thinking, you know what? I, I believe this is the year. Dr. Savell said it. And I believe this is the year, but it hadn't happened. And I'm telling you today, it's arising. I said, it's rising. I said, it's rising. I said, it's rising. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, back in our day, I don't know if they still have it or not, but back in our day, when our parents made biscuits, they used uh, self-rising flour. No, they used flour that, what'd they use? <laughs> All-purpose flour. You had to let that stuff rise. Y'all with me? You had to let, you had, y'all ladies, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it, all right, so what we have to do is when the enemy comes and says, it's not going to work. You ain't going to make it. Say, no, 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 no. It's rising. I sense it's rising right now. I sense it's rising. Come on, somebody thank him for it right now. It's rising. It's rising. Come on. So, somebody, somebody, somebody's been concerned about a financial situation, and, and the Lord said, tell you today that it, it's rising. You don't have to be concerned about it anymore that he's got it taken care of. He's going to show, oh my, he's going to show you, he's going to show you over the next three or four days, and I want you to let Pastor Justin know about this. He's going to show you over the next three or four days um, uh, what step to take and what to do. He's going to turn that situation around just like that. Just like that. And, and I just, I've been sensing this in my spirit this morning, but I've just sensed in my spirit that there's somebody that has been concerned about a family member. And, uh, and, and I, the Lord didn't tell me to call you out, but, but somebody's been concerned about a family member. And I've been trying to figure out if it's a family member that's not saved, if it's a family member that's entered into a wrong relationship, or whatever it is, but he didn't tell me, so it ain't none of my business. So here's what I want us to do. Everybody lift your hands. Father, I thank you right now. But whoever that is, you let them see that that relationship is changing. It's changing. Come on, thank him for it. Come on, thank him for it. That relationship is changing. Glory to God. That relationship is changing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and somebody, matter of fact, this is more than one or two. Uh, this is several. And this, this, this is a word that the Lord has used in my spirit a lot at our church. But somebody is about to get a promotion. And, um, 
and, and, and that promotion is, is one that you, other people are going to say, how in the world he get it? How in the world she get it? How in the world they get that? No, it ain't got nothing to do with natural stuff. It's all got to do with the Holy Spirit. It's all got to do with God. This is the year of promotion. It is the year of it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on, let's thank him for it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. 